Well, hello, that's me again. Today is November 25th. It is after Thanksgiving, so those who had fun, and, you know. Oh, that's me again. Pardon me if those people who will catch me on missing this as they think important thing. But yeah, it's after Thanksgiving. We all in the United States certainly ate a lot of turkey. So, but it's over now and time to get back to all those unpleasant things which are happening around the world. Although not all of them are necessarily unpleasant. It depends, of course, on the point of view, so to speak. On vista, if you wish. And um, we will start with uh, not really a sensation. We knew it all along. I mean, this has been floated by number, of, for example, Russian media nonstop. Obviously, everybody in Russian foreign ministry knew that. Everybody knew in Russian government in general about the situation, but here we have now the uh, undeniable uh, um, um, testimony of the person who was there for, uh, in, you know, in very important capacity, and here we have this. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, they say that Ukraine conflict could have ended in spring 2022. Kiev's top min, uh, uh, member of parliament uh, described it in one of his presses, and David Arachmian, he led Kiev's delegation in talks with Moscow in Istanbul. And uh, he was a leader of delegation, and guess what he says suddenly, and he comes out, and that also indicates the end of the game for Ukraine, because everybody begins now to find a way to exonerate themselves, or to kind of diminish their role in the atrocity which happened, which they initiated, but here we have it. And he was talking about that uh, one of the uh, um, conditions for, uh, from Russia was that Russia's goal was to put pressure on us so that we would take neutrality. And this is, uh, uh, we're talking about this famous so-called Kiev offensive, which was not really offensive. It was the, uh, the, the, the action or, or the tour de force, demonstration of force to convince Ukraine to the negotiating table because Russia didn't want to, you know, just uh, kill so many Ukrainians, to put it mildly. And here it is. So uh, Russia's goal was to put pressure on us so that we would take neutrality. This was the main thing for them. They were ready to end the war if we accepted neutrality, like Finland once did. Well, that's the separate story, of course. And we would make a commitment that we will not join NATO. This was the main thing, said Arachmia. However, agreeing to neutrality and giving up NATO membership would have required changing the constitution of Ukraine, Arachmi explained. Secondly, there was no trust in the Russians that they would do this. This could only be done with security guarantees, he told to one of the newspapers or whatever media outlets. And here comes this bomb. During the talks, Arachmi added British then Prime Minister Boris Johnson arrived in Kiev and told Ukrainian officials to keep keep fighting and not sign any agreements with Moscow. Johnson's role uh, in scuttling the peace talks in Istanbul was revealed already in May 22 by the outlet Ukrainska Pravda, which is, by the way, one of the major supplier of the fake news. However, neither the British politician who was ousted as PM in June that year and eventually landed a job <laughs> an American think tank, nor the U.S. government ever officially acknowledged pressuring Kiev into reneging on the draft agreement, which Arachmi himself had signed with the Russians. Kiev had likewise never officially commented on this matter, until now. They did now, and now we know absolutely, with the full clarity, that um, England, well, I don't think so Boris Johnson intellectually is developed enough to develop any kind of the strategy. He has a major, actually, the degree in British literature that we'll talk about this separately down the road in this uh, video. But the point is, of course, that it was United States pressuring and sending uh, Johnson as their messengers, albeit, you know what, there is still some, some chance that he was doing this completely on his own, thinking that United Kingdom is still great power, which it is not. And as you can see yourself now, suddenly it begins to make very much a uh, big difference from the start of this uh, ideology campaign by the West using Ukraine as RAM, because guess what? The war, as Mr. Um, 
McGregor himself, and I've been telling this for a while now, that's what he says, that uh, war in Ukraine is lost, and Douglas McGregor claims Washington has already sent almost all of our war stocks, uh, uh, weapon systems, and ammunition to Kiev. And he stated that, uh, you know, basically Washington does not have a great deal left in terms of the stocks of what we, it's called non-diminishing stocks. Uh, it's called nesnezhaimy. You cannot just go below this uh, stocks because it's a minimal uh, quantity of anything you need, for example, in military uh, sense to fight the war. And here what he says, the war in Ukraine is lost, he concluded, calling on the fools to make peace. But here is the issue. Russia was ready to make peace with preserving Ukraine, essentially, with the exception at that time of the two uh, uh, oblasts, two regions, of course, it's Lugansk and Donetsk, and Ukraine would have been okay. But the West, and especially driven by idiotic, I mean, it's just absolutely... Uh, I, I don't have words, I don't have enough, you know, verbal apparatus to describe this uh, idiocy which they thought, because they really did believe that they can win, uh, again, defeat Russia. That is the most horrifying thing, that people do not understand, didn't understand what they were dealing with. But, as such, they prevented any kind of the peaceful uh, arrangement between Russia and Ukraine, and we have today what we have. It is a catastrophe for uh, Ukrainian armed forces. They are preparing now the new draft of the mobilization uh, order by Kyiv regime. And of course, uh, they are being pummeled now into other submission. And yeah, there is uh, up to the point that they do not even have enough means now to respond, for example, on Russian attack by artillery or by the bombs. That's it. There's no response anymore because it's, most of it is gone. There are no people who can man uh, sophisticated weapon systems. There are no people who left literally physically to defend front and Russians sit now and, you know, scratch their head about what to do next. Because obviously, as I am on the record, non-stop for a year, the main problem with Kremlin is not the war. The main problem of Kremlin is the strategic discussion of how much Russia need to take now. And we now know that actually, while Mr. McGregor calls on for peace talks, here we have this, oh my gosh, it is of course uh, the most yellow of the yellowest press, it's built on Sondag, for uh, 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 German tabloid, yet even that German tabloid breaks this news. Strategy by Schultz and Biden reveals new secret plan for Ukraine. Well, it's a tabloid. They need to sell you all kinds of the trash and garbage as some kind of sensation. In reality, it's boring. I mean, like hell, you know, it's just absolutely not interesting because first, neither Schultz nor Biden nor their teams can develop strategy. They just can't. They are not qualified. They do not understand what strategy is, how resources match, strategic goals, uh, strategic aims, and of course, most of them, they do not understand more than war. They simply don't. And so here's new secret plan for Ukraine. Build searches show its uh, machine translation from the browser. So forgive me if some things uh, will read kind of awkwardly, you know. So, but here we have. Bill Schultz's show, Chancellor Schultz and U.S. President Biden will soon bring Russia-Ukrainian war to, to an end. I don't think so they can do that, but hey. But Ukraine President Zelensky is to be forced to negotiate with Kremlin dictator Putin in a very specific way and accept brutal compromises. First, uh, Scholz is a pipsqueak. He is nobody. Fact is, the political weight of Scholz is negative. Why Biden? I don't know. Well, so, but. There are people who run Biden as a person, whatever is left of Biden there as a person, as a human. Uh, that means primarily those uh, uh, shysters from Obama administration and the same uh, level of the intellect as uh, of Obama or Susan Rice, that means not very developed intellect. So they still think that they can end the war by uh, convincing themselves that Russia wants uh, negotiations. Well, Russia wants negotiations, but now it's not negotiations. And <laughs> as 
Now legendary hero of Russia, Aptia Laudinov, the commander of the Ahmad Brigade, legendary brigade, the Chechen. Well, it's not just Chechen, there are a bunch of Russian, Tatar, Chechen, you know, all kinds of guys. So he stated today that, uh, yeah, those peace talks are actually about <laughs> unconditional surrender. Russia will come to the table and says what it uh, Ukraine will have to do or how it will exist if it will exist uh, anyway after those so-called peace talks but they desperately need peace talks in Washington because obviously it is all as it is always the case by those uh, I mean I don't know the illiterate uncultured people who run Washington today uh, it's basically all about uh, elections and of course the possibility of Mr. Trump winning those my gosh can you imagine what's gonna happen to those people who are pushing the uh, uh, <coughs> Russia gate BS and all kinds of things you know thrown against Trump if he wins elections considering that we get to those elections well it's going to be a serious demolition of basically their structure which have been erected by Democratic National Committee and all those shysters you know including again as I already stated from Obama administration who essentially run uh, Biden and that is why we are talking about that third term of Obama this is what is this all about Obama had his own uh, personal uh, basically devils and he complex of inferiority compared to Mr. Putin and so he hated him he always hated him because he recognized what he in him what he never could be I mean the real man with the incredible background and here you had the community uh, organizer and that's why he went on this uh, really uh, convoluted and very you know strange path trying to settle account with Mr. Putin and Russia not understanding that um, he was a very different league much lower one but this is what we have today and <clears throat> if as if they uh, those people do not understand what is happening we suddenly we suddenly have this oh my gosh the economists this is tabloid and again there are no no normal people working in the uh, British media literally no they are not normal people in the sense that they are uh, basically qualified in terms of passing judgments or passing their uh, basically ideas and opinions, competent ideas on economy or military or what have you. But even the economist among this choir of all those voices calling now that we need to take, you know, make peace with Russia and, you know, Ukraine has to kind of give up a bunch of other things for, you know, <clears throat> but it's uh, not about, it doesn't work like this. However, even Economist, which is the one of the major provider of the BS also, uh, begins to, uh, for example, two days ago, oh my God, Russia is starting to make its superiority in electronic warfare count. There may not be much the West either can or will do to help Ukraine. Oh, okay. These were the guys who were telling that Russians were actually using their chips from their uh, washing machines and, you know, just taking their uh, toilets uh, from uh, Ukrainian homes because obviously Russians... Uh, if you go to Moscow, it's all one huge outhouse, you know. So, but this is uh, what it is. Economist writes this and says, "Well, yeah, we're pretty much screw, screwed." But then, of course, there is a other thing which they came up recently, and this is the uh, question mark, uh, which is very, very uh, symptomatic. They on the November thirteenth this year so it's basically uh, 12 days ago they <clears throat> one of their authors Arkady <laughs> Ostrovsky writes this thing Vladimir Putin cannot keep funding this war forever but after winning Russia's presidential election in March he will try well there on um, this piece has been written by Mr. Arkady Ostrovsky uh, let's take a look who uh, Mr. Arkady Ostrovsky is here is his curriculum with time and um, look at this Russia and Eastern Europe editor the economist and he you know just reported from Russia since 2007 including the business you know and politics a Yukos affair you know Mr. Khodorkovsky and many people he killed you know he ordered their uh, basically murdering he put the hits on them and their families by the way but hey whatever and look at what he has 
Well, he is a regular contributor to radio and television programs around the world, including the BBC and NPR. Arkady holds a doctorate degree in English literature, University of Cambridge in 1998. Oh my gosh, the same degree as Mr. Boris Johnson uh, 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 holds. And as you can see yourself, you, these two people are literally illiterate. And he, Mr. Ostrovsky contributed to the first Cambridge History of Russia theater as well. You know why he contributed this? Because what he studied and his the previous degree is actually in the history of theater. Can you believe this? You can have the degree in the history of theater. Why don't you have degree in the history of the toilet or bobsleds? I don't know, but evidently you can you can have those degrees. And that's exactly what Mr. Arkady Ostrovsky is. And that is why he doesn't understand why Russia can continue to fight this war. And Russia can continue to do it for a very long time. And that is why, you know, you cannot explain that with the guy with degree in a theater history and English literature what real economy is and especially what Russian economy is and military industrial complex. You just can't. They do not have toolkit, intellectual toolkit. You go to the economy, even if you go to the economy departments, forget about the English literature department, how you can explain to those people who literally learn some verbiage and learn about the stories written by great writers. And they, of course, have degree in language, which is important. Make no mistake, philo philology is important. But how the heck can you explain it to the Boris Johnson sitting in 10 Downing Street? He would know the crap from Shinola. If you would come to, the, to him and explain what is happening with, for example, nuclear deterrent in Great Britain, the only th thing uh, they would have, and believe me, he had this, is what was told to him by people, many of whom represent, for example, military and economic, uh, basically, block in the government. But even this is not necessarily guaranteed that they would deliver the appropriate information. So can you imagine, you have several points at which the whole picture of the world is being completely convoluted and perverted. And you have those people who would know the difference. They don't have apparatus. They don't have background. They don't have education. So how can you explain to him that uh, Royal Navy out of those four uh, Vanguard class uh, strategic missile submarines, they really can put out to the sea only one that most of the astute boats right now are rotting next to uh, in the pier on uh, dry docks because they don't have spare parts they haven't been produced yet you just can't it's impossible the same as it is impossible for example to explain to jake sullivan who has degree in law what modern war is he simply doesn't have tool and he doesn't have time to study it because guess what it is very complicated you need to know a lot of math, a lot of physics, and I'm talking not high school math, and I'm not talking about high school, well, high school physics essentially non-existent in the United States. So how you can explain it to him? So you have some reference or people who work in whatever they work, the you know, research centers and those uh, advisors who themselves are actually ignorant. They have degrees in all kinds of things of this nature. and. You get this, you get this garbage in, garbage out. As a result, they are shocked into seeing what is happening right now and why Russia is not in the rush, is not basically rushing to make any kind of the big arrow uh, uh, offensives, which probably is coming anyway. So, but the point is, uh, when you look at the number of the casualties on the Ukrainian side, it's terrifying. And if that hasn't been enough, uh, so, what can I say? Uh, Russian economy is growing. It is growing three times faster than any growing, actually, economy in European Union. And it's going to accelerate. And this is not just production of the military material and, you know, hardware. It is production of all other things which matter from, you know, rolling stock, all those brand new and, uh, locomotives, brand new electric, uh, you know, uh, trains or uh, uh, commercial aircraft, I mean, uh, nuclear energy. And you begin to 
I'm not even talking about consumer goods. Consumer goods are booming in Russia, from furniture to what have you. And when you look at this, it says, yeah, what can I say? Useless. You cannot explain it to them. But this brings us also to the very important military-industrial complex issue of Russia. And I, before we start, I want to immediately tell you that actually Russia, uh, 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 the numbers given here from the uh, 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 Wikipedia, uh, these are the only numbers we can really use because obviously the actual uh, uh, numerical complement of Russian Air Force is top secret and numbers which I am pre presenting here are definitely, uh, uh, you know, we'll need to catch up because the number of the aircraft is ex much larger. And if you take a look at the, at least they say it, it was by 2022, you will see yourself that out of the multi-role and fighter aircraft, Russians have uh, uh, about, as you can see yourself, uh, uh, Sukhoi, uh, well, Sukhoi S-234 is multi-role ground attack. It's above 150. Just recently, another ba batch has been delivered, and I'm talking like last week. So it's probably, I will speculate, we'll look at around 160, 100 something of Sukhoi S-234s. Then we have Sukhoi uh, S-235s, uh, which are uh, uh, project, they give 118 probably. Uh, in reality, uh, we know that, again, new batches have been delivered and batch could be anything between two to uh, six to whatever number of the aircraft. And they have been delivered throughout the year a number of times. So we're looking at about probably 130 plus Sukhoi Su-35s. We're looking now at Sukhoi uh, Su-57s uh, in a, uh, numbers we know that above 10 of them flying missions next year they will have to, uh, additional 22 so we'll have about a regiment and a half of those now flying and then when you look at uh this uh, highlighted in yellow mig 35 6 mig 35 uh, s in service and they are in service they are pre-production models and then you look uh, go up and you see yourself that uh, out of mig 29s many of them updated you have 70 mig 29s uh, 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 ub which is the, uh, the, the two seater they write about 15 mig uh, 29 smts well actually it's more than that and i believe it is something like uh, on the order of 30. but we're gonna leave it uh, at that so you have more than 100 ma many more than 100 of MiG 29s and their different iterations, but why it is important in terms of the six MiG uh, 35s. And here is why it is extremely important. Here we have this situation. This is a uh, Russian news agency, RIA News, and then suddenly they have uh, <coughs> uh, two days ago admission that United Aircraft Corporation sp spoke about the use of the MiG-35 in a special operation. And they're talking uh, the, about the six pre-production models of the MiG-35, uh, which are actually actively participate in the operations, uh, 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 air combat in a special military operation. And here we have, <clears throat> today, in connection with the events that are taking place, the machine, Russians use this machine as the model. So they talk about the not single machine, they're talking about the uh, uh, several uh, aircraft, six of them, MiG-35s, uh, uh, took part in the uh, special, and take are taking part, as we speak, in special military operation, and they talk about is already participating in all operations that are being carried out. Further test flights are still to be completed, and then the Ministry of Defense will make the final decision, he said, Mr. Karatkov, who runs the MiG, and answering the question whether a decision has been made on serial purchases of MiG-35 for the Russian air Airspace forces. Karatkov noted that the characteristics of the MiG-35 suit also the foreign customer. In parallel negotiations are underway on export supplies. And look what is important here. The MiG-35 is the latest aviation complex of 4 plus plus generation created using the technologies of fifth generation fighters for operations in zones and read this high intensity armed conflict in conditions of saturated air defense. The aircraft is designed 
designed to destroy air targets at any time of the day and in many weather conditions, as well as to engage mobile and stationary ground and surface targets. It has all kinds of those perks, including a very advanced helmet-mounted target designation system. It also has its fully net-centric uh, net sentry capable aircraft and look at this it's armed with a powerful aisa uh, active electronically scanned uh, radar zhuk zhuk a actually zhuk a is the beetle zhuk means beetle it is very powerful radar it's uh, comparable not as uh, you know co comparable to the latest uh, modifications of the for example a belka radar which is used by su 57 and is being uh, and uh, uh, being installed on the su-35 being uh, moving away from the irbis radar they are installing this uh, aisa radar there and of course <coughs> You can see it yourself, <coughs> MiG-35, with Zhuk radar. As you can see yourself, it has the refueling a probe, aerial refueling probe. And it is obviously a very modern aircraft. It's of <coughs> two-seater, has the, its own glass cockpit, as you can see yourself. Extremely advanced, and it has the all aspect, uh, if need be, installed uh, engines with the, which give it also high maneuverability it also has special um uh coding which uh, reduces its uh, signature in other words it is an extremely advanced aircraft and when people compare for example it with the rafale you know the so rafale by Brit uh, i'm sorry french uh there is now very important thing entry which rafale doesn't have because they are very closely matched in many uh, uh, respects except for rafale having slightly larger longer the uh, combat on um, range but there is issue obviously that uh, 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 MiG-35 carries weapons which Rafale doesn't have and we're talking about all kinds of funny things like R-37s and of course being fully net centric uh, capable uh, aircraft it can operate within any kind of the topology so to speak it can uh, basically communicate between the let's say uh, uh, the flight of MiG-35s communicate with Su-35s or Su-57s it probably is capable of carrying their dedicated uh, co-pilot i mean their drones operate drones and things of that nature it can obviously communicate with uh, ground and uh, aerial targeting uh, uh, systems so as um, you can see it's extremely advanced aircraft and of course it's super maneuverable unlike uh, a rafale but but and here comes this very important thing as you can see yourself uh, People say that uh, uh, the Russian Minister of Defense <coughs> will make a decision, but um, already everything show, uh, basically points out to the fact that Russian Ministry of Defense will purchase it, because as you already saw yourself, I showed you, you have about 100 <coughs> MiG-29s of the mo uh, older models you need to substitute in Russian Air, uh, uh, Air Force, and of course MiG-29 uh, MiG-35, pardon me, is much lighter uh, uh, aircraft than, for example, a Su-35 or a Su-57. And you need this light, uh, you know, frontline uh, <coughs> fighters such as MiG-35. And guess what? <coughs> it is cheaper also than marvelous Sukhoi's air combat aircraft. By the virtue of being smaller, obviously, <clears throat> but still being extremely sophisticated and extremely advanced fighter. And so I think so the decision will be made. And that's the point. <clears throat> MiG-35 uh, already took, since 2022, an active role in the aerial combat and fighting in the extremely dense electronic warfare and air defense systems uh, 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 environment in Ukraine. Rafal never faced anything like this. And that brings us to the point that when this you have this entry into the CV, into the resume of your combat aircraft, which is fought in real war, the only modern conflict of the 21st century, guess what? It matters a great deal. And that uh, means that it will be extremely competitive with Rafale, for example, down the road. And it, of course, it will go also for the expert, not only basically substituting all that block of 100 plus, probably we're looking at what, 150 uh, light uh, light frontline fighters such as MiG-35, and they will go into production, I think so. For a stalling question, people say, what about a 75 checkmate? 
Well, S-75 Checkmate is even lighter and it's a single engine aircraft. It is extremely advanced, it is full stealth, whatever, fifth generation, but these are two different aircraft and I think so finally Russian Defense Ministry made a decision that they need MiG-35 and not only to support obviously the legendary brand of Mikhail Gurevich uh, 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 Design Bureau, but also because yeah, they need actually aircraft which MiG-35 is. And I think so, <clears throat> the, uh, the fact that it evidently very successfully fights in the special military operation <clears throat> means a lot. And that probably which will make a final conclusion on putting it in serial production or Mikoyan, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, for example, plant which produced uh, uh, Mikoyan Gurevich uh, MiG. Well, fighter planes, uh, just to give you an example, the relatives of my wife worked on one of those in QA, no less. And <clears throat> so um, the, everything is ready, including industrial base. They have cadres, they have everything to uh, uh, launch it immediately. And don't forget, this MiG 35s, they have been produced recently and they have pro been produced on those facilities. I think so, Russia goes for it. and. That uh, <clears throat> makes a Russian Air Force, my gosh, that's a very special issue. I need to uh, talk about it. And so <clears throat> here we have this today. And just to <laughs> give you the final news today, evidently Pope <coughs> Francis wants a Patriarch Kirill of Moscow Patriarch to meet him in Qatar on the, you know, the summit of the uh, climate change. <laughs> Uh, uh, people thinking now there's a discussion why Patriarch should go there to discuss what? The issues which Russia doesn't even want to discuss and of course about climate change, I'm sorry, this is, this is like r ridiculous. But we know what is this all about <clears throat> because uh, uh, Pope understands that the break between Russia and the West happened on the level of garments, I mean, in, it's a fait accompli now. And uh, obviously, <clears throat> uh, uh, Catholics and Pope, they have to t uh, uh, keep an eye on what is happening in Europe. And what is happening in Europe is not nice for the native indigenous population. And, but Russians say that Patriarch shouldn't go. And I don't think so, Russian pa uh, Moscow Patriarch would, will agree on this summit, but to discuss what? So, but yeah, it, it, it has been made, you know, and people should understand it's over and done with. Russia is not negotiating with these people. And this is what I wanted to tell you uh, today about all that. And as always, guys, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel and support me financially through Patreon and buy me coffee or two. And I want to wish you all good, nice weekend. I'll talk to you later, guys. Bye bye.